Hey everybody, glad you made it back. I found this one <laughs> and it's uh, let's just say it's straight from Chili's lawyer's mouth. And when you watch this, you understand exactly why his case went the way it did when he asked for his bond. You know exactly why. It's straight from the horse's mouth. Let's give a listen. Go get in your car and do your job, little doggy. He's a pig. Excuse me? I said he's a pig. God damn! He hates every law enforcement officer in the United States. All right. Please stand up, sir. This is a to do justice. I'm a little I don't like police. Here's the docket. He was convicted right here. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, there was a motion to create a standby counsel for his attorney, which is kind of an awkward thing to do. Uh, judges don't really like it because what you're saying is I'm competent enough to know the rules of evidence. So I'm going to be held to the same standards as a lawyer. If the maximum sentence is six months per charge and the judge gives him six months as a first offender and six months for another one as his first first offender and then runs them consecutively. So that's a year in jail. That would generate its own appeal. And the uh, appellate courts might say, you know, in all the cases you've done, how did this guy get the you know heightened punishment? How did you give him the maximum? So the judges always play that game back. They anticipate a appeal. And they say, well, we gave him the mid-range sentence for each one. Well, then that's not an abuse of discretion. Surprise me was the consecutive sentences. I wasn't expecting that. Very hard to win an appeal on a misdemeanor case unless you really want to throw a lot of money at it. I was mentioning how uh, the Nevada sta the Nevada statutes, in my opinion, this to me looked unconstitutional because it was too broad and too easy to subjectively bust somebody. I'm never in favor of a law like that because, like I said, an innocent person get busted. Trolls are having a field day with what's going on with delete laws, Hendry, and flex your freedoms. And it makes me wonder about the motivations of people who seem to love cheering on the violation of personal freedoms, including their own. Why do we have fun with this? Why do we cover you and Chili and all those other people you mentioned and everybody else in the fraudered community? Because you lie. You lie to your audience. You lie to everyone. Absolutely wrong. You are not fighting for anyone's rights or anyone's freedoms. My rights and freedoms are being taken away daily. There are some states I can't even go to. Do you ever fight for those freedoms? No. You fight for a goddamn camera that catches nothing. You lie to people saying your news. You lie to people saying you're covering stories. That's why. Why don't you open your ears, tell the truth just for once. They'll still funnel you money. They'll still do it. You don't have to lie to them. Just tell them the truth. You can't. Because then you would be caught. And then you know. You know you lose every time if you tell the truth. Not with your audience, but with the rest of the world. This is trial attorney Patrick Darcy, and he gives his professional opinion on whether Chile de Castro can overturn his two convictions on appeal. And before I play what he says, Chile's lawyer, Christopher Oram, has already requested a hearing and appealed and made a motion for bail or, in the alternative, a recognizance release. There is a hearing set for Monday, April 1st at 8 a.m. And I'm sure the trolls will have a field day with this date. A field day? Oh my God, I want it to be a national holiday. Not April Fool's. From now on, I want it to be Chile de Castro Day, the, the crybaby day, the day that we all get to point and laugh at a fake, lying, manipulative con man. That's the day. April 1st is now Chile de Castro Con Man Day. Here's some of what Patrick Darcy believes will happen during the appeals process. Well, now that Chile has lost on his two counts, and is in jail. Let me just what I think is going to happen with this appeal, because I think he will appeal. First of all, he's dead wrong if he thinks the appeal uh, will be decided within the next six months. No way. It's not a high priority case. It's a misdemeanor case. It's going to probably be a year and a half before it's heard. But 
he's not getting out in 30 days. No way. Also, uh, you know, they would know that he's a flight risk because of the uh, warrant that's out in Ohio that I'm told is out there. I saw that in a traffic stop. So um, getting him out on bond would be very difficult. He'd have to pledge collateral and security, especially with a bail bondsman thinking that he's going to abscond. So I think he's staying in jail. This is what he's talking about from publicdocuments.com. There are two active warrants issued by both the city of Oregon and the city of Ironton, Ohio. One is for criminal harassment. The other is for resisting trespass and disorderly conduct. In neither case is there a victim. No one was threatened, no property was damaged or stolen. Nevertheless, there are two active warrants, which seems like it would diminish the likelihood of any kind of early release. Ah, the sovereign citizen defense. That always works. Keep going. Keep going. No harm, no foul, right? Is that what it should be? What about the appeal itself? A lot of people have a misunderstanding of what happens with appellate process. First of all, he is going to need an appellate lawyer. Appellate law is a completely different animal than regular trial law, trial work that I do. Appellate court is going to look at errors in law, errors in admissible admissibility of evidence, testimony that was not supposed to be entered into the record. Uh, but before they get to that step, they're also going to be looking at whether or not the person complaining about it did what's called invited error. In other words, did they object on the record to this? If there was a, you know, this was a very short trial, so the record is pretty small. This right here is where Chili's lawyer might have hamstrung him. I don't recall a single objection from Michael Mee, but plenty from the prosecution. In the appeals process, they're just looking for errors in how the trial was conducted. Not about who lied. It's not about looking for any kind of evidence. They're looking for errors that affected the outcome. If not objected to during the trial, it's usually waived. And it looks like the hearing to get Chile out of jail will again be brought before Ann Zimmerman. So the likelihood that she'll grant that seems slim to none. I mean, bruised egos stay bruised for a long time. This has nothing to do about bruised egos. She followed the law. She followed the law. This is a man who's been running around unchecked, who won't even fess up to the crimes he does have. He just leaves, doesn't come back. He's proven it. You even said it. Two cases, two warrants, doesn't care. He wouldn't come back. He would bond out and f leave. This is about a man who's been running around unchecked, who brags, brags about costing the taxpayers money, brags about it. I'm glad he's in there. He won't learn his lesson, but I'm glad he's in there. I'm glad he's serving time. He's, he's being held accountable for once. And I applaud it. Let's just talk about what the judge did from an appellate point of view. From an appellate point of view, she said very clearly that she based her conviction on what she saw with the videotape. Now, was it a good idea for Chile to give the thumbs up and agree he hates all cops? She even said, look, he's nodding approvingly here. No, uh, it's never a good idea to antagonize a judge when they're handing down a sentence. In terms of the sentence itself, it's in the midpoint of what she could have offered. So I warned about that. And I also warned that they could string them together consecutively in my other video. You guys have all seen that. I, I went out and told you what I thought would happen. And it pretty much happened as I told you it would. Six months is a long time, okay? That that shocked me. That was harsher than I was expecting. I mean, the DA wasn't even looking for jail time in a suspended sentence. And the judge looked at the DA like, you got to be kidding me. So did the judge abuse her discretion? No, you, you're going to lose on that. I'm just telling you, you're going to lose. The judge has wide discretion. Discretion isn't unbridled, as they say. There are limits to discretion. Uh, for example, uh, discretion does not allow her to commit an error of law. In California, for example, if you want to file a 170.6 motion to disqualify a judge, you have to do it within, I think, either 10 or 15 days of being served it. The other thing is, is that Chile's antics in the beginning of the case, calling the marshal a pig, the judge could have held him in criminal contempt, a 
criminal contempt is any violation that's in front of the judge. But the judge warned him and decided not to. So that's going to count in her favor when people say she's biased. What I heard was basically uh, the lawyer arguing the defenses that Chile was going to offer, First Amendment defenses. Well, First Amendment defenses, those are pretty touch and go. I don't like those because this is a criminal case, not a civil case. And in a criminal case, you better have case authority like the judge asked for. You better have case authority that supports your position that this is an absolute defense to uh, the charge. It's not uh, not easy to do in the criminal arena. And if you say, well, you know, and I have saw people writing this, you know, uh, well, you know, you can't criminalize a constitutional right. Yes, you can. It happens all the time. Uh, I'll just give you some obvious examples. You want to yell bomb on an airplane? Good luck. Your First Amendment doesn't cover you in an airplane. Okay. You can't uh, yell fire in a theater. You've heard that cliche because it's true. There are limits to everything. There is no such thing as unlimited constitutional liberty. The constitutional test for you YouTubers out there that want to be lawyers. Rational basis. Any rational decision by the government will be good enough to, to apply it as long as it's applied in a neutral fashion. Next is, uh, you know, there's a mid-level scrutiny and then there's strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny is anything that would impinge on a constitutional liberty and it has to be narrowly. And there must be a compelling government interest. I didn't hear any cases discussed in the, in the closing argument that would support a First Amendment defense. Now, Michael Meese said that he submitted them to the judge. It is in the record. The appellate court will do its own legal research and analysis on that. And there's the question of the admitted evidence. We only had two witnesses and only the cop was cross-examined. Chile wasn't cross-examined, which really surprised me. I mean, I would have had a lot of fun cross-examining him. The prosecution didn't need to question Chile. It, it, it's like watching the Dower Brooks case. He made all the evidence for the prosecution, as did Chile. There was no need. I mean, Chile made the case for them. His antics in court made the case. As much fun as it would have been to cross-examine Chile, there was no need. Zero. But you'd only have fun cross-examining him? Love for you to explain that one, Mr. Darcy. So the appellate court's going to see, was the evidence competent? Was it admissible? Was it relevant? Were there any objections to it being admitted into evidence? And if not, how prejudicial was it? Would it affect the outcome? Next, there's a lot of other ways that you can admit evidence, even if you fail to object. Maybe there was a mistake and it shouldn't have been admitted, whatever. It doesn't change the fact that the parties that were in that tape were the ones that were narrating what happened. The cop was, yeah, that's me, that's him. Yeah, that's the distance, that's what I said. It's coming in in a different way. It's coming in through direct testimony. Anyway, the tape, even though it got admitted, there was enough there, I think, independent of the tape to still convict him. The next issue would be the constitutionality of the statutes themselves. There's an uphill battle here. Trial courts required to uphold the statute because it's been declared constitutional. I've already gone through all of that in another video, if you guys have read and watched my videos. I gave you the cases, in fact, and I analyzed the cases. The Nevada Supreme Court has declared these statutes constitutional, and they have used officer safety as the primary motivation. So, what did the cop do? He talked about officer safety. Now, there's a problem with what he said. He's given an inconsistent statement. He says that he, officer safety is the reason for the 21-foot rule, but at the same time, he also said he didn't think that Chile was going to threaten him, wasn't a threat to him, and that's why he didn't tag Chile with a more serious battery charge. So officer safety really wasn't the overriding concern here. Let me just say from my perspective, I got a client who thinks he knows everything and thinks he's smarter than me, he's smarter than everybody in the room, and he's not, okay? All right, <laughs> he's not. Never. Would I tell a client, okay, you can take over the case and I'll just sit back and watch you. And if you have a question, I'll help you with that. Never. A person who is untrained in that is going to flounder. It looked to me like what happened was, is me was supposed to t uh, step down and Shirley was supposed to take over the, the case. But now the judge is coming back saying, no, I'm not going to allow that to happen. Now me's the first chair again. And now he's off balance because when he thought he was going to be sitting in the background, 
Now he's in the front line. And I think he was very uncomfortable with the whole situation. I don't think that he showed, I mean, when he was crossing his arms, uh, you know, I don't think these are the arguments that he wanted to make, but he has to do what his client wants. Bottom line is, is that I don't see this uh, appeal working out too well. The deck is stacked. The Supreme Court would probably just simply punt back and say, we've already ruled on the constitutionality of these cases and that's it. And then force Chile to go to the Ninth Circuit. Now, if he goes to the Ninth Circuit first without trying to develop a record in the lower courts and the appellate courts, then he has less of a chance for them to even hear the case because they turn down over 90% of the cases that are given to them anyway. I think the convictions are going to stand. He does raise an interesting constitutional question because I do not like the statutes. But we'll just have to see. Uh, but he will definitely need legal representation for this because these appeals are difficult. Well, there you go. Straight from Chile's lawyer's mouth. But do they listen? No. This guy's going to be wrong every time. The judges are going to be wrong every time until they get a judge that will rule in their favor or until they find a lawyer that will just tell them everything they say is true. So everyone, hope you enjoyed this. I'll catch you on the next video.